When a container dies, the host node's kubelet process will automatically recreate it. But when a pod dies, it's not automatically rescheduled. And if a pod is not rescheduled, its containers aren't either. Therefore, your pods are vulnerable. For instance, they might be accidentally deleted or evicted from a node due to a lack of resources. And once they're gone, they're gone. Kubernetes' answer to this problem is called a controller. This is a category of component which takes on the responsibility of scheduling a replacement for a pod which goes down, whatever the reason. There are a number of different types of controllers. Each one is designed for a different use case, but the common thread between them is that they all monitor a select group of pods and do whatever it takes to make sure that the right number of them is always running. In this chapter, you'll learn how to create and when to use three different types of controllers. Let's dive right in. The first controller that we're going to look at is the replica set. A replica set config file is composed of two important parts, a pod template, basically the guts of a pod config file, and the replica count, the number of replicas that the controller is supposed to keep running at all times. When you create a replica set, it creates the desired number of pods using the pod template. If any of those pods die or get evicted, the replica set creates a replacement. Likewise, if the replica set discovers an extra pod, it will randomly delete one of them. Basically, a replica set is like a car's cruise control system, but for pods. Here's an example of a replica set config file. Like all component config files, it has the four standard fields, namely API version, kind, metadata, and spec. Under spec is the replicas field. It holds the desired number of pods that you want the replica set to keep running. The template section is what the replica set uses to create pod replicas. Notice that the replica set has two label selectors in this example. Most importantly, the pod template must define labels which match those label selectors. Keep in mind, any pod which matches the replica set's label selector will be managed by that replica set. It doesn't matter if the replica set created the pod or not. This situation can be especially problematic when you have two replica sets which both select the same pods. For example, one controller might be trying to reduce the number of pods, while another controller might be trying to maintain a larger number of pods. The controllers will battle it out forever. This is why you should endeavor to make every controller's pod labels unique. A replica set can have its own labels. They might be exactly the same as those found on the pods, or they might be different. The point is that the two are completely unrelated. You create replica sets like you create any other Kubernetes component. For example, let's check to see if the replica set that we just created is running. This is the number of replicas that are currently running and this is how many pods are fully initialized and ready to go. So if more pods are running than are ready, then some pods might still be initializing, for example. Here are the pods that the My Blog replica set created. Notice that the name of each pod is the combination of the replica set's name and a short random string. These names were automatically generated. I think of a deployment as a replica set on steroids. A deployment does everything that a replica set does, but a deployment can also update its pods without any downtime. The deployment takes care of creating the updated pods, while at the same time slowly killing off the old pods. This process of swapping out updated pods for old pods is called a rollout. Sometimes you run into a problem. Perhaps you accidentally updated the pods to a buggy image version, and now you desperately need to roll back the last update. Luckily for us, deployments make it easy to roll back an update and undo our mistakes. Replica sets can't do that. This is why replica sets are best thought of as a lower level component. They have a job to do and they do it well. On the other hand, 
Deployments are a high-level component. Each deployment actually creates a replica set behind the scenes to make and maintain the correct number of running pods on behalf of the deployment. To put it simply, you should prefer deployments over replica sets. But what if you don't need the update and rollback capabilities provided by deployments? You could try to optimize by just using replica sets. But there's no need to do this. Deployments are very lightweight, and it's hard to anticipate when you'll need their extra capabilities. So prefer deployments over replica sets. In this example, we're going to create a deployment. But first, take a look at the following config file. Your basic deployment config file is very similar to a replica set config file, so we'll skip the tour. Instead, let's just create the deployment. Here's confirmation that the deployment was successfully created. This is how many pods should be running, and this is how many pods are running. This is how many of the pods are using the current version of the pod template, not an older version. Lastly, this is how many of the pods are initialized and ready to go. Remember how I mentioned that every deployment creates a replica set? Well, here's proof. The name of the replica set is the combination of the name of the parent deployment, my blog in this case, and a random value. Okay, just as a point of interest, notice that the pods are still named using the same naming scheme as all replica set pods. First, the replica set name, followed by a short random string. 